in a modern legend, uh, Mary Magdalene becomes uh, Jesus' lover and wife, and in the Da Vinci Code, she actually bears him a child. Mary is such a strange figure in some ways because traditionally people have said she was a prostitute, and yet Jesus chooses her. I just can't imagine the authors of that time, the men of that time, making up a story like that. It just gives too much to her. And why would Jesus have done that? The contents of an ancient text unearthed in Egypt at the end of the 19th century offers a whole new perspective, one that has not gained universal acceptance, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of Mary enshrines Jesus' own regard for Mary, portraying Mary as a leader of the church and an, an intimate of Jesus and someone who actually holds uh, a wisdom that is unavailable to anyone else. In the Gospel of Mary, Peter, the disciple, says to Mary, Sister, we know the Lord loved you more than other women. Why don't you tell us some of the things he said to you that we might not have heard? Then Mary shocks him by saying, Peter, I'll tell you some things that were hidden from you. And Peter's very angry. Well, that's probably why it's not in the New Testament. The main importance of Mary Magdalene in the New Testament is that she comes with Jesus from Galilee to, to Jerusalem at the end of his life, and she observes his crucifixion. And in the traditions, she's the one who goes to the tomb on the third day and finds it empty. Two days after Jesus Christ is removed from the cross and buried, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Mary Magdalene comes by herself. She's there at the tomb, and she's looking for Jesus. We don't know why, but she's there, and she's insistent. So she gets there, and the stone has been rolled away. I mean, this makes no sense, right? And she realizes that Jesus is not in the tomb. So she runs back to tell the disciples, Peter and John, to say, the, the tomb is, is open. The role that she plays in this drama is to be the messenger. She tells the others. At first, they don't believe her. For the traumatized apostles, who are hiding from the Jerusalem authorities who have crucified Jesus, the news is terrifying. There's no question that the apostles as followers of Jesus, as known followers of Jesus, who were in mortal fear for their own lives. What had been a dangerous situation was now a very, very dangerous situation. And they ran to check and see for themselves. And apparently she follows them. These two men came to the tomb. They looked and they saw it was empty. And they left. They run out of there, you know, and Mary stays behind. And this is where Jesus first appears uh, after he has been resurrected. It's one of the most important moments in Christianity. According to the New Testament, the first of Jesus's six key appearances after the resurrection and the beginning of the lost 40 days. Without Magdalene, without the seeker, without that one person, none of this is possible. Somebody has to be willing to look hard enough to examine the impossible. Years of research and study of religion, science, and technology all come down to a single moment, an attempt to depict one of the most astonishing moments in recorded history, the instant when a resurrected Jesus Christ stands revealed before another human being. He says to her, Mary, calls her name, go and tell my other followers that you're seeing me, that I'm alive. This is the moment in history, the hinge upon which of all uh, history turns, this 
moment that he, he's revealed to another human being in resurrected form. It was a moment of faith for her. It was a moment of love, an encounter with the risen Lord. Doesn't look like a burial shroud anymore, does it? <sighs> yeah. Quite a, quite a transformation. Yeah. The shroud is at the bottom of all this, you know? This is the closest that we could get to what Jesus looked like. Did you, that's did the, you know? the thing, that's the, the thing at the core of all yeah. of this. Yeah. Well, that's the start of the 40 days. Yes. One down, five more to go. Yes. Within hours, there will be another miraculous encounter. Appearance number two in the history of the 40 days between resurrection and ascension. In the mission to reconstruct the six key appearances of the 40 days between resurrection and ascension, the challenge gets steeper for Ray Downing and his team. The image of the bloody and mutilated body on the Shroud of Turin once again paves the way. Well, the good thing about the appearances is they build on each other. It's a progression. It builds, and every one of them finds Jesus in a different way. Mary knows him because he knows her. When you get to the next one, the men from Emmaus, a ritual sparks their, their memory, and they remember it's Jesus. According to the New Testament, Jesus' second appearance takes place on the road between Jerusalem and the town of Emmaus. The appearances of Jesus in the post-resurrection period serve a very important function. We have a story of a dead man coming back to life. But what does that look like? What does a dead man who came back to life look like? What can he do? And we find out Jesus is a very different phenomenon as a resurrected person than he was before. What has happened in science just in the last 30 years has opened up so many possibilities for alternative ways of looking at physicality. Science in some ways and faith are coming closer together as each is willing to admit mystery. It's very important in these days in which religion and science are sometimes put one against the other, as if they were contradictory, to go back and say, before doing that, Let's recognize the fact that we ourselves, as historians and scientists, have to be honest. We have to respect evidence. We have to respect primary sources. We have to respect trustworthy sources. I think that's what we're seeing here in these 40 days. Let's get down into it and see what really happened. What happens during these 40 days in the New Testament? Can we look beyond the Gospels to find things that were left out? And if so, why? The Gospel writers are quite honest about the fact that Jesus did and said many more things after his resurrection than they're going to give an account of in the Gospels. And so they're selective in what they choose to talk about in the Gospels. Some scholars question whether the Gospel writers were being selective or restrictive or was there even a darker agenda? One of the theories about why the gospel writers don't tell what was happening after Jesus' resurrection, why they don't give more stories, is that the stories that were available to them weren't, weren't uh, relevant to their interests or, in fact, were counter to their interests. That uh, possibly there were stories about Jesus that didn't make him sound like a real flesh and blood human being after he had been raised from the dead. What could be the reason for the gospel writers to limit the number of witnesses to the resurrected Jesus Christ? Luke has a certain, he has an A-list. There are certain people that he wants to, that, 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 that show up on that A-list. They are the apostles, they are Jesus' inner circle. Basically what that means is you don't have any access to Jesus now. All you have is what we tell you. Therefore, we have, if you like, a monopoly on the truth and nobody else can have any because there's no other access to Jesus, that's it. All told, besides the four Gospels, there are 23 other books in the New Testament, including at least seven letters authenticated as having been written by the Apostle Paul. Do they contain information about the resurrected Jesus Christ during the lost 40 days? 
In Paul, he makes offhanded references to all sorts of appearances that we don't hear about at all in the Gospels. Like where he says, uh, at one point, Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. That is... For centuries, there has been a legend of a land untouched by time. Explorers have vanished searching for it. Most of us are familiar with our world as we view it from weather satellites on the evening news. These satellites go around the planet from east to west or from west to east. There are a few satellites called polar satellites that go around the Earth, North and South Pole. However, data is not available to the public for a view of the North Pole or the South Pole. Only the center section. Many newly founded occult sets discovered that there were esoteric lodges before them, such as the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, and the Illuminati, who were pulling the strings of world politics. There are only a few polar satellites. In February of 2006, the federal government issued a data denial implementation plan which secures the continued flow of real-time meteorological satellite data from the NOAA, provided instruments on board EUMITSAT's METCOP spacecraft to public duty users in the United States. During episodes that might otherwise require data denial, data denial means real-time data from U.S. environmental instruments can be denied during periods of crisis or war. There are no publicly available images of the North Pole. A journey to the center of the Earth. It wasn't just science fiction. As it happened, Shortly after the First World War, young officers of the German army were introduced to an esoteric lodge called Tula. This lodge uncovered the secret world conspiracy of the Illuminati. These officers were extremely excited when they discovered that the war they had just lost had already been predicted as a conspiracy during the 19th century in the secret scripts of the wise men of Zion.